And these days we also have uh, executable specs, which are specified in Python. So the core developers are working on, first of all, this specification, if you can go further, it's, it's also all there. So first of all, the specification, then the implementations. The implementations of Ethereum are on two layers on the consensus layer, uh, handling the proof of stake, actually, the, the validator said they, uh, uh, the, the consensus of the network and the execution layer, which is uh, which includes executing the transaction, having all the state, all the Ethereum data, all the contracts. And of course, uh, we need to be able to test this. Uh, there is a heavy testing infrastructure of various uh, various uh, uh, various domains, uh, which uh, makes sure that these implementations not just work and work together, but uh, also follow the specification. Um, and uh, all of this is uh, kind of led by uh, many, many researchers from all the various organizations who are trying to uh, who are trying to uh, find the best solutions of the cutting edge issues in the blockchain in Ethereum. Um, on the other hand, like when when you say Ethereum developer, people mostly imagine people writing in Solidity, building on Ethereum itself, right? So there would be some DeFi apps, some, you know, uh, NFT projects maybe, or uh, even layer two sort of infrastructure, uh, like maybe some block explorers or stuff like this, which is um, which is built on top of the Ethereum. So uh, to give you the idea of what numbers we are working with here, um, the, the core developers, of Ethereum are in, uh, the, uh, we, would, we would be here um, in low hundreds, like 100, 200 people uh, in the Protocol Guild, which is an organization, it's an on-chain uh, magic list, which is uh, uh, including all, uh, like, uh, it's opt-in list for core contributors to um, uh, to uh, be able to have some parallel sort of funding. And there is 128 people, but again, and it's opt-in, so there is not all of them. Most of the people uh, from Protocol Guild or from the core community uh, is on this picture we met in Austria uh, on on January. So you can see that it's it's a wonderful group of people. Um, yeah, um, but uh, it, it's not all of them, of course. Uh, the the projects in uh, the the core ecosystem uh, are very wide. There are many different domains. There are not just the clients, but you know, there's always some library or some piece of tooling which which somebody may Maintain somewhere. Um, uh, this aggregator is uh, pulling various repositories and identifies over 200, sometimes up to 300 uh, contributors to these these various repositories. Again, they don't list specifically which ones, so I would guess that it might be even more. Uh, however, if we compare this number to actual Web3 developers, we see a big difference. So the Web3 devs are people building on Ethereum, right, using the Ethereum technology but not contributing to the Ethereum itself. And um, Ethereum is, is leading in the number of, of uh, these Web3 devs, uh, the, you know, the dev developers. Uh, there is, well, uh, let's say at least 10, 20, 20 times more than the core contributors. So uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a big difference. And um, uh, the, 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so the, the the main difference here is that the app developers are working on the high uh, layer. Basically, it's uh, it's um, the smart contract layer using something like Solidity or Viper or Fee or maybe some uh, these days whatever compiles to uh, to EVM like some Cairo, um, building the DeFi applications, the things that users actually use, and uh, building these the developers are responsible for how the app behaves and uh, the security of the user's funds or the, the security of the user data uh, is uh, their responsibility, the, the responsibility of the app they are using. Um, it's also a competitive environment. Many uh, Ethereum, uh, many protocols in Ethereum are maybe some public use, but a lot of them are businesses or even DAOs, which have some profit incentives. So they, they tend to be rather market driven, and uh, yeah, they are building they are building kind of a fancy cars, uh, or <laughs> um, the the stuff that people use because what what the core devs build is the road, it's the the actual platform that they are building on, right? So to build the actual platform to build Ethereum itself, we need low level languages. We need the the, the uh, languages which allow us some software architecture, which is uh, mostly uh, Go or Rust or C plus plus Java. Uh, even TypeScript, 
um, uh, or maybe NIM. Um, and so, so there are so these languages which allow us to build efficient and secure software. And um, uh, this is this is the, uh, how the um, uh, the consensus execution clients are implemented. Um, the, the work done there is still maintaining them, upgrading them, optimizing them, and most importantly, upgrading upgrading them to, for the newest EIPs. Um, and uh, if you think about it this way, um, the core developers or the uh, the people working on the clients themselves are responsible for security of all of the users of Ethereum, not just a single app. So it uh, it bears certain uh, commitments, certain responsibility, I would say. Uh, but uh, that's why we have all the uh, robust testing um, and uh, uh, cooperative community for. It. So when I say that it's cooperative, it's very unique because compared to the market-driven economy of companies building something else or the core develop the core developers are directly collaborating so people from different teams different companies come together to build the things together to make sure that it works and it's and uh and it's all properly specified and uh interoperable um yeah it's so it's more ethos driven and uh yeah um so why is it important um uh yeah why is it important why maybe some web three devs here or other kind of developers or technical people might be interested into the core development and it was mostly mentioned here um it's the development of the clients themselves so the implementations of ethereum the actual nodes running the network right if you ask what is ethereum i like you can that does the thing with the blockchain right you can send tank to a bank because bank has the building ethereum will never have that because it's thousands of computers running this very software all over the world and each little computer is running the code that you can contribute to and um yeah so the contributions by directly contributing or testing upgrades maybe benchmarking and um generally improving ethereum by researching uh some complex problems um so uh, I would I would uh, I would say that uh, without the core devs, Ethereum uh, wouldn't be here. I mean, uh, it's kind of obvious. Like if we want it, we need to build it. Kind of a duocracy uh, approach. Uh, but um, all the work uh, done on launching the Ethereum on the frontier, the homestead, all the upgrades till now, till the merge, Chappelle, it's all uh, was done by. These good contributors, and of course, there are different people before than now. Uh, but uh, they they some come and go, some stay. Uh, they're all working towards the same vision. Uh, it's sir, sir, so we say that Ethereum is a, a sort of an infinite garden. Um, it's a game that we don't play for winning, but for playing. It's a, it's a garden that we will uh, uh, where we will have to uh, you know improve and uh, trim here and there. And uh, I see it as a as a uh, it, it really comes from the uh, comes from the free software movement and the cyberpunk culture of the people who are trying to build this distributed and uh, free software, which uh, allows us the coordination and uh, is the vision that that people uh, that people follow here rather than just some market incentives. That's what that's what makes the core open unique to me. Um, and uh, when I talk about the complex and interesting problems, that's another reason uh, why I see people around me working on the core development, because it's not just some shared vision, but it's very interesting problems. It's uh, if you like to solve problems, there is a lot of them to do. Um, so this was around the merge. I'm sure if it was before or after the merge, Vitalik saying uh, Ethereum is still only about 55% finished. There is a lot of boxes to fill, as you can uh, see in the roadmap. Um, uh, each in different domains of Ethereum, different parts of the computer science to tackle here and to um, to work on. So uh, it's it can be also very open and creative. Like basically, whatever problematics you get interested in and you want to get into, it's your opportunity to just come and learn and contribute. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's all uh, all of this research because of. Uh, 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 various issues that need to be solved in Ethereum, but generally what, what you know about is the, the scalability trilemma, the blockchain trilemma, and um, uh, uh, all of these people have been putting very hard work to researching uh, potential solutions which can uh, keep the network as decentralized, as secure as possible while uh, achieving some scalability. That's, these are these are really the cutting edge solutions to the to the uh, 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 blockchain technology that we have and like the probably the biggest example 
example of a huge collaboration of people, completely open collaboration of, of people distributed all around the world, which which um, um, was successfully done as as this lovely transition to the merge, right? So the, the, the merge happened in September 15 last year, and it was it was just incredible to watch how people each everybody doing their own thing but contribute towards the higher goal, right? And uh, yeah, this is this is what uh, what these people are doing, and I think that's I think this is the last slide uh, before Josh takes over because Josh will actually explain you how can you. Um, uh, become one of these contributors and work on all the all the interesting stuff today that I mentioned. Awesome. Thank you, Mario. Uh, yeah, so the Ethereum Protocol Fellowship, as Tim mentioned earlier, uh, is is a program that's designed to make the process of becoming a core developer, a researcher, or contributor easier, uh, clearing the path forward so that um, there are the least amount of roadblocks and you can uh, spend some dedicated time learning and applying any of the things that you learn towards becoming a contributor to the Ethereum core protocols. A little brief history of the EPF. It was originally a program started by uh, an early core developer, Piper Miriam. Uh, it was called the Core Developer Apprentice Program. And, and his idea was to find uh, developers that were going to be able to help him work on a project that he started called the Portal Network. Uh, he hosted two cohorts originally um, to do that and then passed the program off to the uh, foundation protocol support team to to uh, host the program in sort of a, a wider, wider sort of manner. Um, so it is coordinated and funded by the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, the design of the program is 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 meant to mimic the core developer experience. So it's a largely self-directed program. Um, you're able to choose what you get to work on. Um, it's, you know, the main mode of communication to the greater world is through different technical updates. Um, and, and it's really meant to uh, allow you to figure out how to find your way in this ecosystem um, through, you know, your own research, but also through uh, accessing and the um, developer community asking help uh and gathering guidance from uh mentors and and the uh ethereum core developer community uh it is coordinated majorly through uh, a github repository and uh, as well as a discord um, channel within the eth r d discord um, and then we do host a couple of weekly meetings each week to to have some you know face-to-face -face time uh, it is a permissionless program, which means that anybody is welcome to join the program and will have more or less the same uh, resources that somebody who is officially accepted into the program. So we do encourage people to uh, participate permissionlessly. Um, our application review process is by no means uh, perfected and, and, you know, we're human and we make mistakes when it comes to applications. So we invite people who maybe don't get selected uh, to be a part of the program to, uh, you know, prove us wrong and, and show us why um, you should uh, maybe be a part of the official cohort, um, receive funding, that sort of thing. So some of the benefits of the protocol fellowship, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you get to work closely with the existing core developer community. Um, it is a semi-structured process, so we do, you know, have some structure in place to uh, keep people accountable and allow uh, you to have some some feeling about, you know, what what it is that you're sh you should be doing through this four month program to, you know, help you uh, along in your path. There, um, you get to work on what you're passionate about, so the problems that you're interested in, the areas of the of the core protocol or of computer science generally that you like to work on and you like to research and that you feel passionate about are the things that you get to work on. Um, there's also the mentorship aspect, which allows you to have access to the people who are already working on the core protocols, the people who might have uh answers to your questions or able to point you in the direction that you need to be going to solve a problem that you're not really sure uh how to solve 
Um, there is a financial stipend that is associated with the uh, people who are officially accepted into the program. Uh, and we do keep aside uh, a portion of that stipend budget for those people who per participate in a permissionless manner that are doing good work throughout the throughout the program. And then you also, yeah, you get the experience of what it's like to to contribute to an open source software project like Ethereum. Uh, we finished up the third cohort in February of 2023. It's a four month program. Uh, we had over 600 applications for that program. We conducted 40 interviews. Uh, there were 24 official uh, accepted um, applications. We ended up having about 36 people uh, participate in the program, so 12 people permit, participating permissionlessly, um, and then I believe five of them ended up becoming, you know, sort of official fellows through the permissionless uh, track of that program. They worked on 20 different projects uh, with 27 different mentors, uh, and yeah, they. Uh, the, Fellows created 300 different development updates. Um, as of, I believe, two months ago, 40% of the uh, fellows that were in cohort three have some sort of placement within a client team, within a research team, have been granted in some way to work on a project that they, uh, they were excited about working on. Uh, I'm not going to go over each of these different projects, but these are some of the projects that uh, that fellows worked on um, in cohort three. Uh, and I did highlight one that um, after the cohort was over, uh, one of our fellows that was working on um, the deter attack defense, their their um, the Geth client had had that sort of DOS attack happen very, very shortly after the program was over and, and the work that that fellow had done on this uh, attack defense came in uh, very handy during that portion of time. So how does the program work? Well, here is a brief timeline of, of the of the process. So there are three different phases of the program. The first phase is what we call an onboarding phase and it lasts for a couple of weeks. Um, this, this will be time for you to meet the different uh, fellows in the cohort, get to know more about the program and the expectations that are uh, set for the program and for you to take some time to get a brief overview of the current landscape of the Ethereum protocol and the current set of problems that are being worked on. Um, we do have a list uh, that is kind of ongoing of different projects that our mentors and other people from the uh, developer community are hoping to see worked on or would like somebody to work on potentially if that's if you're maybe struggling to find uh, a project to work on. Um, and then, so yeah, once you've done that sort of uh, cursory overview of the problem scape, uh, you will go into phase two, which is the learning and project selection phase. This is where you'll do a deep dive into that uh, particular issue that you're looking into or the project that you'd like to work on, really getting to know the different uh, nuances of, of that project. Um, then you'll start to create a project proposal. This would be probably similar to what it's like to create an EIP or or some other kind of um, you know proposal for for upgrading or creating something within the uh, core protocols. Um, and then you will get uh, feedback on that project proposal and the project in general and iterate on it. And then um, we do a a a. I think it's over two weeks. We do uh, project proposal presentations where uh, you will, you know, spend five to ten minutes giving a presentation on your project, why you think it's important, and how you're going to tackle it. And then the majority of the of the time in the uh, in the fellowship is the project execution phase, where you're actually working on your project, getting feedback and assistance from your mentors and fellow um, fellows in the cohort. You will host these weekly stand up meetings where you, uh, you know, will give sort of a, a 
brief overview of your progress through the week, be able to ask questions of the fellows, um, and and maybe have um, you know Mario and I point you in directions of people to talk to if you're struggling with a certain roadblock of some kind. <clears throat> and then uh, towards the end of the of that third phase, you'll do a project report where you you know uh, it's a written report where you you know sort of give an overview of your time in the in the uh project as well as like you know the different things that you struggled with the different avenues that you took in order to solve the problems that you were having and, and just generally how the project turned out where it is currently if it's complete or not that sort of thing uh and then this cohort will end with a, an in-person um meeting at uh dev connect in istanbul um so this will be a time where fellows will get to meet face to face have some time to chat about their time in the fellowship and and also give some in-person project presentations so what it might be like to uh you know speak at a conference on what you're working on or you know just generally give you some more sort of uh public speaking opportunity um so that you can verbalize your thoughts to to others that are working on similar things. So if you are interested in joining the Ethereum Protocol Fellowship, the fourth cohort, we encourage you to apply. Uh, <clears throat> um, successful candidates will have uh, strong written and verbal communication skills. Uh, the majority of this program is is you know done remotely so it's important that you're able to speak about the the project that you're working on and and just about the technical aspects in general uh, you'll also be writing weekly or bi-weekly updates about what you're working on so being able to to write about what you're working on as well is definitely a handy skill to have um, it's important that you're self-directed and self-motivated Again, this program is not designed to to hold your hand, but it's designed to uh, you know mimic what it's like to actually be a core developer, somebody who's you know typically working remotely, um, and you know needs to have some some aspect of of self motivation. Uh, it is important to have somewhat of a technical foundation um, to be able to write some code, uh, be interested in low level architecture. And also having a passion for Ethereum and for decentralized technology in general is also a very important uh, aspect of this program. So when writing your application, it's very good to uh, have well-written answers in your application. Uh, we encourage you to put some thought and some effort into the application uh, answers. Um, I would discourage you from using chat GPT or other AI tools to to write those uh, responses within the application. Uh, it's important to have an active GitHub account of some kind. <clears throat> we definitely understand that not everybody has the opportunity to, you know, work on open source projects all of the time or or maybe, you know, the work that they do is not able to be shared. So it's certainly understandable if you don't have a super active GitHub account, but when you are uh, submitting your application, it would be important for you to to sort of explain um, what sorts of projects you have worked on in the past and why you why they aren't necessarily able to be shared. <clears throat> um, making open source contributions to either uh, issues and 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 things within the Ethereum ecosystem or generally other open source um, software uh, platforms is great. Um, having some low le level language proficiency, things like uh, Rust and C++ and, and, and Java and all of these sorts of things, it's great to, to um, mention that in your application. And if you've done any kind of, uh, you know, protocol work, peer-to-peer -peer work, things like that. So uh, the application period is open until June 16th. The program will begin in mid-July and it will run through mid-November. And as I mentioned before, it will culminate in EPF Day at DevConnect in Istanbul. Um, yeah. So these are a couple of QR codes for you 
to scan if you so desire. One is to the Google group where we do some very high level uh, communications talking about um, ways to participate permissionlessly or just announcements about different cohorts. And the other is the third, uh, the, the GitHub repo for the third cohort. Um, we do have another repo for the fourth cohort, which sh should be open at this point, and uh, we'll throw a link to that in the chat if it is still um, legible. So thank you for listening to this presentation and for joining us on this uh, town hall meeting. Uh, I We're going to open it up for questions, and we'll see how this process goes with uh, you know the issues that we were having earlier and hopefully it will be great so if you have um questions feel free to post them oh my god there's so many things there's already yeah maybe oh. i can i can run through what's already been shared in the chat um cool that's yeah um so first of all yeah people are asking for the slides we can post those there uh, as well um first question was out of the 36 participants last time how many became core devs yeah, so uh, as of, I believe, a month and a half ago, about 40% of them uh, have been placed in some way, shape, or form. So that, that could mean that they received a grant through the um, Ethereum support program, uh, that they were hired by a client team, that they were hired by the Ethereum Foundation, the research um, wing of the EAP. Um, so there's a lot of uh, different sorts of ways that you can become a core dev. So, um, but 40% of them uh, currently are working mm, full-time on, on uh, core development projects. Um, also, I guess, oh, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I, I, just a note that like um, the 20 projects which has been delivered, like all of them were meaningful contributions. So like uh, one thing is being um, being uh, actually employed somewhere, we're getting a grant, but like even the work within the EPF was the actual contribution that people did. And uh, to me, I would say that they already became a core for the core contributions. Um, and the placement rate, uh, or like what we talked about here, uh, with 40%, also important to know that some of those people uh, just uh, uh, decided to uh, to work on something else or maybe finish the school before uh, before joining uh, some teams. So um, I would say that it's really up to you. Like it's uh, these projects uh, can easily prove your skill, and then it's uh, it's pretty it's relatively easy to to get hired uh, wherever the help is needed. Awesome. Um, okay, so second question is the fellowship only for coders? It is mainly uh, geared towards people who, uh, you know, can write code. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you need to be able to write like production ready code, although that is definitely helpful. Um, we do have a lot of uh, people who, from the last cohort who were more on the research side of things and so interested in researching the different things. But, you know, it is handy to be able to be able to express your thoughts in code. I don't know, yeah, or Tim, yeah. I was just going to say, so like, yeah, it's important. I think they keep the program focused on actual core, you know, protocol development and client development. And the EF does a bunch of other grants rounds, you know, for like different research areas, everything from like, you know, social science to like math or, you know, more like abstract uh, technical research. So I think for this program, like, being comfortable with the Ethereum network and its implementations like as a live thing is probably the main thing. And, you know, a lot of this is obviously software engineering, but like we mentioned, like the, the example from the presentation, you know, around the get the mempool DOS uh, protection, um, that's something that started much more on the research side. And then they work with the get team on like implementing a fix. So like, there's probably some branches of research where it's like very applied, you know, to things like, uh, whether it's like networking, you know, DOS uh, and, and, and things like that. Um, but if if you're completely outside of those domains, then there's probably other grant rounds from the EF that are a better fit than uh, EPF. Uh, Mary, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add. 
Um, I just wanted to mention that I would really recommend to check the past project. So uh, we have the lovely recap blog that was mentioned uh, on the blog of Ethereum org next to the applications open. You can find uh, also there is a link in the blog post to the, the blog, uh, which is uh, explaining the previous cohort and all of the projects are linked there. Uh, also in the repo from the last cohort, you can see all the work which has been done uh, by the flows and the projects. You can get an overview that like most of them is some development work. Some of them are also just like you know data analytics or building tools which enable some some more clear uh, uh data or actually there was uh there was also the work on the mev uh some sort of crypto economics uh, um uh, uh implemented in uh, the open games engines if you're interested in game theory there is also um uh, some logic to apply in the research there but um um uh, that's this different to the minority of the program or the, the most of the projects. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Uh, okay, next next question was what's the monthly uh stipend if you're accepted? So we do uh stipends based on need, basically. So we ask you to uh calculate your uh, your monthly burn rate, the amount of money that it takes for you to to live basically for a month things like food rent uh and and basic you know life necessities and then um that's sort of the number that we uh, would would ask for in terms of what you would receive for a stipend so the program isn't meant to give you like a developer's salary per se but it is meant to allow you to spend the four months focusing on the project and not have to worry about the things that you would need to to survive. Um, okay, next up, I'll try to run through those because it's more and more. On what basis are the applications accepted, um, and how much are you expected to know about core development? So, the second question we sort of touched on a bit, but maybe the first part of the question, like what what are the things we look at for good applications, and and that you know help us make a decision. Yeah, so things that we look at, we definitely look at GitHub profiles a lot. We'll look at the repositories that you've contributed to, the different things that, that you've been working on within the GitHub. Uh, we definitely read all of your answers to the different questions. Um, this particular cohort, we've added a new question into the application, which is asking uh, applicants to describe some kind of technical concept either in a video or in a um like an essay format so you know giving some idea to us to as to where your technical knowledge is at um additionally you know just describing different projects that you've worked on giving us some kind of you know brief resume like idea of your skills and you know the link the languages you work with and and the things that you're interested in um as well as just having uh, an interest in Ethereum itself, we, you know, definitely highly rate the the passion that people have for for working on um, these kinds of projects. But I don't think that there's any like hard and fast like boxes that we have to check in order to to say that somebody is is worthy of you know having an interview or whatever. So. Um, yeah, there's not there's not like a a thing that I can say that this will definitely get you into the program. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, if I'll you can elaborate please. a little, uh, just yeah, everything that Josh said, like um, um, uh, we're looking to see that you have technical insight, insight into Ethereum, but then uh, we invite people for the interviews, so um, uh, um, we have we will have uh interview with the subset of people that we that we decided and we will get to know more there. And the thing is that if uh, we, we have these applications here and you can apply even, but um, the thing is that the program still stays open and permissionless. Uh, so the idea is that even if you don't get accepted or even if you don't apply, you can still just come and contribute. And uh, from the past cohort, we learned that there have been people that we uh, did not accept or maybe didn't apply, just show up, did the work. And after a month or two, we see that they are doing a great job and uh, they deserve the stipend. So we offered it uh, also retrospectively. So like uh, if you don't get accepted, you can prove us wrong just by coming in and, and, and uh, showing the skill. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess it's sad. 
Okay. Um, sorry, I'm going back and forth in the chat here. Um, okay, so this- There's just, a question oh, around okay. the, good. I was gonna say the next one is like, do mentors ever become overwhelmed hmm. by having so many people in the program? <laughs> uh, we didn't necessarily experience that per se. Um, you know, we do ask fellows to really make an effort to try to solve the problems on their own before they reach out to mentors doing doing a lot of their own research. And, and if they do have to reach out to mentors for something that they can't figure out to really have a directed question or, or ask of, of the mentor so that, um, you know, there isn't a ton of time spent on the back and forth communication around what it is that you're actually trying to figure out. Um, so we didn't, yeah, I don't, I wouldn't say that mentors got overwhelmed. And um, I think that a lot of the mentors are understanding that, you know, this is helping to bring in the next crop of developers so that their plates are generally not as full. So, um, yeah, I think they're, the majority of them are happy to, to help. Awesome. Um, uh, I would just Mary? add quickly that there is, uh, you can actually find uh, the list of potentially available mentors, like they're available, just, you know, uh, their things might change, but you can, uh, you can see that there are people covering uh, almost all the core teams. So also uh, what we encourage in the protocol is to, in the protocol fellowship, is to um, identify the project you want to work on, but also check with the peers, check with the others, maybe you can collaborate with somebody on the, the same project with one team and uh, it helps not to get the mentors overwhelmed, like uh, to actually distribute the projects on the various teams. And uh, yeah, uh, so we don't end up with many fellows working with one mentor because it won't be, won't be possible. Okay, next up, what's the required time commitment for EPF? Mm, we don't have a specific time requirement. Uh, you know, in the application, we do ask the amount of time that you would be able to dedicate to the EPF during the four months. Um, we do think that if you're able to, you know, spend only 20 hours or less on the program per week, that it, it might not be the right fit. Um, you know, that's certainly, again, not a, a rule by any means, it's more of a, of a guideline to go by. So if you already have a full-time job and, you know, a family and you have a lot of other sorts of obligations that you have to take care of in your life, it, it may not be the right fit for you. But also, you know, if you're somebody who also likes to stay up all night working on passion projects, then, you know, certainly feel free to apply. Uh, it's not something that we, it's sort of, uh, much lower on the list of things that we take into consideration. And I would say maybe I'll add something to that. There's like the reason why time commitments is so hard is because at the end of the day, quality is what matters more than quantity. And people have like very different like outputs based on time. So if we said like, oh, it has to be 20 hours. And then I don't know, somebody who can actually do great things in 10 hours a week feels like they can't join, that's bad. Um, but like you should expect during the program to make like a meaningful contribution to something like one of the projects that's listed there. So if you like read through the list and you know you think that's the type of thing you can tackle in like four months, then um, yeah, that's that's pretty much the bar we're, we're going for. Um, and related to that next question, is it okay to express, express an interest in more than one project in the applications? Yeah, certainly that is, certainly a possibility. Um, you know, we want to hear about all the different things that you're excited about within uh, the protocol development world. And um, yeah, you can express interest in all those different things. And, and, you know, in phase one of the program, the idea is that you're, you know, able to do a, a, a very high level overview of the different uh, sort of things that are happening in those different spaces. But then, you know, once you kind of hit phase two where you have to choose a project, you, you know, we will ask that you choose a project to, to focus your time on. That doesn't necessarily mean that you can't spend time working on other things, but we would want you to focus mainly on one project. I mean, if you feel like uh, maybe doing two smaller projects, if you feel like you're a Superman and you can do two things in four months, I mean, I believe like 
the, the program is opened and like it's com completely um, uh, directed by you what you do. So uh, feel free if you feel like it. I, I wouldn't recommend it in general, like but one thing and perfect, right? But um, uh, we also saw people people think uh, after a month of the, the researching one topic, they decided they have to work on something else. So um, uh, the um, the actual uh, a deep dive in the first two weeks of the program should be the the the, the real time of the um, when you when you decide uh, on which you want to want to finally work on. Awesome. Um, a question by Amora about uh, can we say more about participating in a research capacity? What's an example of a topic that a participant might research? Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Mario. Um, so um, there is a lot of research going on in Ethereum ecosystem. Um, so I would I would check out the project ideas. There are also some research, you know, less development uh, things mentioned. Uh, one of the things I mentioned before is uh, more of the crypto economics topic uh, topics uh, handled by the Rick Robust Institute Group Research, uh, which has uh, it's linked in the project ideas. It's the uh, Rick open problems, open questions. Uh, you can uh, you can find uh, some of the research they are interested in there. Um, it might be like the cutting edge, the current uh, stuff happening. So right now there is the uh, a development for 844, which still might require uh, some um, maybe some benchmarking, uh, some uh, uh, you know more of an applied research. Uh, and then more theoretical topics, which are still far, far ahead, but uh, are very interesting and need to be figured out, uh, such as single source finality, maybe, uh, maybe data availability sampling. One of the one of the one of the fellows from the previous cohort was working on a data availability sampling research, and um, so the research being uh, uh, also uh, if you if you are not aware of the Eat Research uh, website, it's a great way where to. Uh, for, for, for an overview of uh, what's happening in the ecosystem. Let me send you the link. It's E3 search. Yeah. I'll maybe um, add to that one type of research that like I feel we never get enough great people working on is things like simulations and like um, basically, yeah, almost more like, <laughs> experiment like very hands-on research and like one example i can give this is not eps but like i was there you know i called about this right before is like uh for dank sharding you know figuring out how many blobs are we going to have in dank sharding right like and then running things like network simulations or and and this is a mix of like you know you can take a more theoretical approach you can take a more like sort of simulation and and like uh like software approach but things around that like changing some properties of the network or like, you know, um, changing the topology of the network, things like that. And like understanding that a bit better is something where like we could have way more like smart researchers who aren't necessarily like engineers in that like they're writing code for core devs, uh, for, for like core clients, but like are able to use code and like a bit more of like a research and experimental mindset to like, figure out what the right limits for a bunch of parameters on Ethereum are. Um, and, you know, are there, are there like things we can improve? That's like a huge, I think, area um, that almost falls like between research and engineering. So like not a lot of people end up there, but um, I think there's a ton of valuable work to do out there. Um, okay, so there's another question. Can people who already work on client teams apply? Um, I guess you can apply. I think in terms, so in terms of prioritizing who we'd give a stipend to, you know, we'd probably prioritize by default someone who's not already on a client team to try and get them possibly on a client team. That said, you know, if there's an exception, why like it would make sense for you to get a stipend even though you're already on a client team, we can definitely consider it. Um, yeah, so there's no like, there's no, there's no kind of rule against it, but I would just, if you're, if you're, if you're especially looking for the stipend, I would try to explain why, you know, you being on a client team already does not like, isn't like working or, 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 or whatnot. Um, if you want to apply as a permissionless participant, you know, imagine you're on Nethermind and you want to spend a couple of months hacking on Lighthouse and you don't need a stipend to do it, then like, sure, there is no blocker to do that. Um, yeah. 
Um, okay, next question. Is it expected to work alone or can multiple people work together? Uh, definitely multiple people can work together. We had uh, two different projects that had multiple people that were working on them in the last cohort and it worked out really well. Um, so, uh, you know, they were definitely bigger projects. So it was, you know, it was helpful to have a few different people working on them and collaborating together. Yeah, again, it's totally up to you folks, like uh, whether whether you feel uh, like tickling it alone or working in a team, if you're able to find some peers here who are interested in the same topic, it would be great. Um, uh, what, do we, what, what do we notice is that it actually uh, works uh, pretty pretty well when people are just a two-person team, but it still works nice in a way that people, it's easier for, to brainstorm for them. It's easy, easier to save, uh, solve some issues in a way that they can just, you know, talk to each other first before going to the mentor and have somebody to um, to discuss directly with. So um, so I would I would uh, uh, encourage to also um, uh, chat on these calls more and, and find people to work with. Um, how many uh, permissionless fellows ended up receiving funding during the program? And maybe there was another question about like when permissionless fellows would like be selected to get funding. So can you maybe just talk a bit more of like how we approach giving money to permissionless participants? Yeah, um, so generally uh, last cohort, I believe five people ended up receiving uh, funding uh, after the fact as a permissionless participant. Um, what we look for in per permissionless participation is, you know, consistency, like um, really being consistent with your development updates and, and showing that you are working towards a goal uh, and that you, you know, are actively making progress on that particular goal, uh, showing up to the office hours meetings and, and participating in that way is also um, a, a high signal for, uh, you know, potentially gaining funding as a permissionless participant. There's no, again, hard and fast kind of rule around what you what you have to do. It's more about, you know, if you're making meaningful contributions, if it looks like you're, you know, actively participating in, in a way that is going to um, benefit the protocol at the end of the day, then that's that's kind of what we're looking for. Awesome. Um... Uh, okay, so there's a question. What if I only know high level languages like TypeScript and Solidity? Do I need to wait until I understand Go before I apply? Um, I don't, yeah, I don't think you need to wait to necessarily apply. We did have, you know, multiple fellows in the past cohort that were, you know, did need to learn new languages and did learn new languages during their time in the fellowship. Um, I think it's more important that you feel comfortable, you know, with your ability to learn new languages quickly and 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 being able to implement those things pretty quickly. So um, it's not important that you do need that you do know those things, but that you're able to to learn them quickly. Mario. Um, yeah, uh, just I uh, wanted to mention that again, it's totally up to you in a way that depends on what you want to contribute to. Uh, so like for kind of a front end Web3 devs, um, uh, there, uh, there might be some uh, browser based tooling or, or this kind of stuff, which is needed. Uh, one of the proposed projects you can see, uh, like a DevOps uh, uh, wishlist from Pari, uh, you know, certain monitoring of nodes of the network, uh, is, is definitely needed. And it's uh, also like a front end work, which is, which is, uh, uh, important. Uh, but it would be said, there is also a uh, loads. Are, which which is a whole uh, constant client implementation written in TypeScript. So um, if you are um, if you are uh, um, skilled in TypeScript, maybe JavaScript, and interested more into like um, uh, uh, evolving your skills towards more software architecture uh, towards the clients, you can. It's a great way to to learn. And uh, yeah, what Josh said. Uh, it's a, it's a great opportunity to, to, opportunity to maybe uh, learn a new language that you wanted to learn. Uh, there was even uh, there was even a guy who was like a non-coder, like light Python skills, and he ended up uh, contributing to Rust project in a few months. So uh, if you are dedicated, I believe anything is possible. 
And no, there is one client in JavaScript. So there is Ethereum JS. So if it's like actually the programming language and you know, TypeScript is not exactly JavaScript, but like pretty close. Um, yeah, if, if that's like the, the main blocker, you know, uh, you could probably still do some protocol work uh, through Ethereum JS. Um, uh, okay, so there's a question about the interview. So what's the interview format like for applications that stood out? Um, uh, yeah, so Mario and I will uh, hop on his uh, Jitsi or Google Meet or some other sort of uh, video conferencing and, you know, we'll spend a half an hour chatting about what your what your goals are for participating in the program, what your greater goals are for development in general, uh, get to know your skills a little bit more, get to know some of the projects that you've worked on in the past and, you know, just kind of get to know you a little bit better. Um, you know, we can only gather so much information from from written applications. So it would just be, uh, yeah, some time to to chat and get to know you better and see if it's it seems like an appropriate fit. Awesome. Uh, there's a quick question: Is the application form editable once you send a submission? It is not editable. Um, so if you do feel like you need to send some kind of uh, addendum to your application, you can you can uh, send me an email or or a message through the uh, Discord uh, protocol fellowship channel in the ETH R&D Discord. Um, also, my email is josh.davis at ethereum.org. We'll add it in the chat here if you do have already submitted an application and would like to make an addendum. Awesome. Okay, so there's like three questions that are all related that I think I can take. So uh, just Cirque ask, can we put an existing technical write up uh, where we ask to write it about a technical topic? Roy asked me a question between two different things uh, that I answered in the chat. And then uh, Manav just asked whether it's best to speak about like a generic topic like uh, Ethereum Merkle Patricia tree or something that you worked on in general. Um, so I'd say that the reason for this question, like the like why is there in the application is to understand like whether someone can like coherently speak about a technical topic that's like, you know, if not directly related to the Ethereum protocol, like of the same, you know, complexity or like, you know, same types of domains um, rather than just, you know, saying a bunch of buzzwords and like not being able to like actually explain the thing that they do. So if you have like a really strong technical write-up that you've done on something previous, that's like, you know, a even if it's not like a blockchain or an Ethereum thing, but it's like some, I don't know, like API design or, you know, like networking specification or like something like that. Like I th I'd say that that's great. I would just, I'd say if the thing is just very far away from Ethereum, like I, I don't know, like um, I, I'm trying to think of an example of something um, like say, imagine like UX, right? Like uh, which like doing like UX for like a consumer app, um, which is very different than like client work, um, then that's probably less good. But if it's like some other like code project that you've done um, that has like a really high quality write-up, then like, that's great. You can share that. Um, and I think in general, it's probably better to speak. Uh, yeah, I, I'd say if it's an application, it's, I would, if, uh, if it's an application and the write-up focuses on what's like technically novel about it, then that's really good. So like an example would be like an example of something bad would be like, imagine you just go to like, I don't know, ethereum.org, you take the first tutorial. I don't even know what it is, but imagine it's like deploying your own NFT contract and just like copy pasting like the instructions to deploy your own NFT contract. Um, I think that's like less valuable than say you actually wrote the contract or wrote the architecture like for a full application and there's something technically novel or interesting there and the write-up focuses on that, then I'd say that's super relevant, right? Um, um, and like one, actually one good example. So on east.org, there's like a breakdown of like how Uniswap V2, the contract works. Um, and they, that would be the type of thing that like, it doesn't have to be as polished as that. It's obviously like meant for like a super broad audience, but like that sort of goes over the uni V2 contract and explains like what this thing actually does, why it's set up this way. What's like the, uh, the, the sort of supply demand curve and all of that. Um, I saw that stuff is super relevant and in general, I think if you can talk about something you've done, like actually done, that's a better signal for us than talking about like something you want to do or just something that you know. So like if you have, say, 
you know, a project you've done that's not quite about Ethereum protocol stuff, but it is, you know, technically interesting and novel, I would focus on that. And like, as a, as like, I don't know, number one thing, I'd say if, if you don't have that, then like just talking about either a project that you're interested in or like that's, you know, like some topic like uh, Merkle Patricia trees, like if you want to do a short write up on that, I'd say that's that's good because it shows like you can understand the list of projects there and the list of like, uh, you know, topics that, that we discuss. Um, yeah, and, and, and then there's a the last question, can you do more than one write up? I'd say if you submit more than one thing, the amount of time people will spend reviewing it probably won't go up. So like, you know, if you think that like skimming two things is more valuable than like reading one fully, um, like the form won't stop you. But if you submit 10 different things, people are not gonna spend 10 times more uh, effort on your application. Yeah, I don't know, Josh, Miro, anything to add on that? Yeah, I, I think that's definitely accurate, um, you know, we do get a, a high number of uh, applications. So um, the time that we can spend on each one is somewhat limited. So I would I would suggest choosing the one that you feel like is most appropriate and, and submitting that one. But again, the form will not stop you from submitting multiple. Um, and just to kind of piggyback on the, the last things that you were saying, Tim, um, we have had like a number of people submitting applications that are basically giving like a walkthrough of their, you know, uh, DAP that they've developed in a much more kind of like product pitch kind of manner. And, you know, that's really not what we're looking for. We're really looking for you to like get into the nitty gritty of, of like how you made the thing and what the novel pieces are of it. And, and so, yeah, like, uh, your elevator pitch for your, for your DAP is, is not really what we're looking for in the, in the Yeah. And I guess related, right. That's a re yeah, that's a really good point. And Lorenzo has a similar question. Do you actually have to go into the code? I don't think you necessarily have to, but I'd say maybe the, if, if like pitching this to an investor is like the wrong approach, um, the better approach would be imagine you have a new coworker or colleague that's coming to work on your thing, right? And you're like explaining them, it's like their first day, and like you have like 15 minutes with them to explain to them the thing. So, like, it does, you don't necessarily have to go into like, here's what every line of code does, but like, you know, help them make sense of like the technical thing you're describing. That's like the level that we're at. So, that, and, and again, like the use case for this is like, Imagine you get on a call with someone, you know, with a client team, like, you know, can you like show them the thing you've been working on during EPF and like explain to them what it does in like a coherent way. Um, so I'd say this is like the audience you should like aim this for. And if, if the best way for you to do this is to like walk through line by line, here's like a hundred lines of code, you know, first function does this, first second function does this, that's fine. If the way that's best for you to do it is to like actually have like diagrams and like a high level, you know, architecture overview, that's fine as well. Um, if it's literally just like writing words and like there's no code in it, that's fine too. Um, but I'd say this is like, the framework or like the mindset you should be in is like you're explaining this to like a, a smart new collaborator on your project um, and you're not trying to like sell it to them but you're trying like to get them to understand how it works. Um, hopefully this answers your question as well, Lorenzo. Um, there's a question, uh, is there a specific set of EIPs the application focuses on? There's not necessarily a specific set of EIPs. Uh, as Mario mentioned in the repo, there is a list of uh, projects that mentors have suggested um, that that you know people can choose to work on or not. Uh, again, the, the program is designed to allow you to work on what you feel passionate about and what the areas of the protocol that you're excited about. Um, so we don't necessarily pigeonhole it to any sort of list of EIPs, but if you are sort of struggling to to come up with a particular area of interest or or something to work on this uh, uh, link that Mario just put in the chat is a good place to start in the terms of sort of the immediate things that that people are hoping to see done in the near future. Um, okay, there's another question about permissionless versus permission participants. Um, so do unaccepted or permissionless participants still get access to mentors and other tools that uh, accepted participants get? Yeah, so permissionless participants do get the same 
access to all of those resources that that somebody who is officially accepted into the program. The main difference between a permissionless participant and an officially accepted participant is that uh, you know you don't have the stipend right off the bat um, that you kind of have to to prove to us that the the work that you're doing is is worth funding and and that you're dedicated to to participating in the program. Um, just to say a little more about the mentorship, um, it works in a way that it's not like direct guidance, hand holding kind of thing, but uh, more of a uh, more of a um, uh, uh, asynchronous uh, feedback provided by the mentors. So um, again, it's up to you to reach out to the mentor. Uh, they're available in the communication channels that we use, and you can reach out with a, more of a specific question with a pitch to, you should demonstrate that you have the insight, you did your research, and then uh, when you get stuck somewhere, there is a mentor to help you. Uh, most importantly, it, it um, it's uh, the collaborative work when you are opening some pull requests and uh, get you get a review, uh, you discuss the, the, the problems there, right? So it gets, the, over time, it gets more into the PRs, into like the the, the review kind of code, code review kind of uh, work. But um, generally, like the mentorship should be approached with um, again some self-directed, uh, responsibility bearing um, way where you do your uh, you try to find the answer to your question first before going to the mentor. And uh, if the, the mentors uh, might get overwhelmed, uh, and in case that there are too many permissionless participants, uh, uh, it's again, it's not the, our policy or anything, but the mentors uh, uh, end up uh, prioritizing uh, the, uh, the people with stipend. Um, or at least we saw that uh, we saw that before because for some of the mentors it was like too big big interest to to work with them uh, even though they try to to respond to everyone. And one thing I'll, I'll emphasize that you both uh, mentioned is like the idea of like reaching out with a specific question. So like in general, like even outside of EPF, right? Um, all of these people who work on Ethereum like tend to be pretty responsive if you actually like have a question that's like not just the highest level, like, I don't know, what's thanks sharding or how can I help with thanks sharding? Um, but like, if you like are reading the spec and you're like, I don't understand why there's this thing on line 68 or that type of thing, like generally just posting that in the R&D Discord, people will respond to it because like there, there's, there's a lot of like noise at the like what's dank sharding level of the conversation. And, and sometimes, you know, people have to like manage the inbound messages they get, like however it works for them. But there's not a ton of like noise or competition at the level of like, I've read this thing and I don't understand like this subset of it and how it works in relation to all of that. Um, so like if you're able to do that and just sort of get, you know, past like the first level of like actually trying to read through the thing, understand how it works, like highlight the parts that are unclear or like count unintuitive to you. And then, you know, potentially just like, I would search the R&D Discord to see if someone has had the same question as you or like search each research. If you've done like that level of diligence and you still have a question, then the odds are you've probably hit something that actually is unclear or underspecified or like an area of like discussion or research. Um, and then people are usually pretty excited to engage because like that's literally what we're looking for. It's like contributors who can help with all of these things. Um, yeah, so there's a ton of value in doing that. And if you've done like a, a, a relative amount of work and you still feel confused, then the odds are it's like the thing that's confusing and not you that's stupid. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, people will usually uh, be quite responsive to that. Um, okay. I think we had most questions. Let me see if there's anything left. Uh, clack, clack, clack. Uh, yeah, I think those were all the questions. Any final questions or things that we missed in the chat? Uh, feel free to repost in the Zoom chat and we can get it before we wrap up. Okay, well, thanks everyone for coming. Apologies again for the uh, disruption at the start. Um, and yeah, I uh, hope to see, see you all on the R&D Discord.